Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part three of John the Baptist, well, the life of John the Baptist. Uh, I don't think I mentioned it, but there is two Johns, at least in the Bible, Obviously, we had John the Baptist, who was born uh, in the flesh six months approximately before Christ. And then you have the Apostle John, who, was, who followed Jesus. I mean, John the Baptist had his head cut off. So, you know, a lot of some people get the two confused. But uh, John the apostle wrote, penned the book of Revelation. And according to tradition, legend, whatever you want to call it, uh, he, well, <laughs> he's the only apostle that didn't die uh, for his faith. He was the only one that was not martyred. The only one. Well, you know, Judas hung himself, but but um, all the rest of them died for their faith. And you hear the modern preachers saying, you know, well, you know, God loves his church and he's not going to let us suffer. Well, you know, read the book of Acts. You know, what was Stephen? Chop liver? Stephen got stoned and it wasn't some great uh, skunk weed. It, that he got from a CBD clinic in California. Now, so, uh, but supposedly they tried to kill John several times. They couldn't do it. So they banished him to the Isle of Patmos where he uh, had his scribe, which is like a secretary, uh, where they penned where he had, the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, where he penned the book of Revelation. And as anybody that's ever read it, it's pretty wild. It's a pretty wild book. Of course, so is Ezekiel. But, uh, so yeah, just know that John the Baptist and John the Apostle are not the same. All right, so... In Matthew 3, we read Matthew chapter 3. Now we're going to start on uh, Matthew 4. Now in Matthew 4, 12, we read, Now when Jesus had heard that John, John the Baptist, was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And then in Matthew 4, 21, um, now, John's in, John the Baptist is in prison. Uh, John preached hard against sin. And if you preach, if you preach repentance and against sin, people will get offended. They will leave your company or they will repent. And very few are going to repent. When I hear preachers that tell you that repentance is not a part of salvation, I just shake my head. I mean, Jesus taught repent over and over. John the Baptist, who Jesus said, of all those born of women, there's not a greater than John the Baptist. He taught repentance for the remission of sins. And there's people that will tell you, oh, well, Really, you're, we're repenting of our unbelief. Now, John taught repentance for of sin. And uh, what can I tell you? But uh, if people are not offended by the Bible, they're, you're probably not preaching the right thing. So... Uh, I've mentioned it before, but 
I was invited to uh, go to church with somebody and uh, didn't know what it was. This was about, oh, I don't know, 15 some odd years ago. Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. Big old mega church. And uh, didn't know it at the time. And, you know, went there and, you know, they had this huge parking lot. Took probably five or ten minutes just to find the car. And uh, listening to the sermon, I was like, you know, the devil could have sat in the, <laughs> the congregation and would not have been offended by anything said. You know, had a nice rock and roll show. You know, the band was up there and with lights and the big screen TVs. And I was like, what did I get myself into here? You know, but since somebody else had driven, I was stuck. So, yeah, I don't think I ever heard the word repentance, not once. All right, so Matthew 4, 21. And going on from thence, he, Jesus, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, not John the Baptist, John the Apostle, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. You know, it's funny, uh, James and John and Peter were all fishermen. Isn't that funny? Because I guess, you know, uh, Jesus told Peter, uh, from thenceforth thou shalt catch men. See, God wants to spread his net and catch the men. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 9. I've been rambling long enough. I guess we'll read from verse 1. And he, Jesus, entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city, you know, Nazareth. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, Thy sins, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes, well, what's a scribe? A scribe was the copyist. He, they were hand, they would handwrite the Bible. You know, if that was your job, to handwrite the Bible, every single word, and create an entire New Testament, I mean, an Old Testament, what they call the Old Testament. You should actually know it pretty well. I mean, let's face it. They should know the law very well. And one of the things, uh, if you want to learn the Bible fairly quickly, get the Bible on audio. Alexander Scorby has a wonderful voice and you can get the New Testament for basically 25 bucks on Amazon. I hate Amazon, but uh, it's very, very convenient. And you can get the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, for about, oh, I don't know, under, under $100 delivered. I mean, you know, you listen to that on your way to work every day. And every time you go out on your car, you'll be amazed how fast you can learn things. Really. I mean, I did it for a while and, you know, you could either listen to rock and roll or rap or country music or whatever. Or you can listen to the, the Lord, the words of the Lord. So... And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. So th this guy's blaspheming. You know, because why? Because he told, Jesus told the guy, sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Verse 4. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why think ye evil in your hearts? 
For whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. So here it is, this guy's, you know, I don't know if you've ever known people with palsy, but you, you got to be carried around because you can't, you know, you can't walk. Uh, who was that guy? Stephen Hawkins, that so-called famous physicist or whatever the heck he was. Uh, he believed evolution and he was had palsy, couldn't walk. By God, he knows he knows there's a God now because he died. And unless he made his peace with Jesus, he uh, he absolutely knows there is a God now. So, verse 7, And he, the guy with the palsy, arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew, yeah, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, sitting at the receipt of custom, custom as in... Uh, you know, like, uh, have you ever had anything shipped from overseas through the mail? They got to pay customs. They got to pay tax. Well, that's what he was. He was a tax collector. Matthew was a tax collector. And the IRS, uh, he would be an IRS agent in the uh, USA. Or is it the USSA? So he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many, public, uh, many Republicans, I mean publicans, and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Uh, publicans were the um, tax collectors for the Roman government. And that's what Matthew was. They were absolutely hated. I mean, who loves an IRS <laughs> uh, agent, you know? You know, you go see the uh, IRS and you're, you got to write him a check or whatever. And you're going to say, you know, that IRS guy, I really liked him. I really love that guy. Eh, said no one ever, right? Uh, they say death and taxes, the only two things in this life that you can uh, guarantee to have, right? Well, that's for those that don't know Christ, or Christ doesn't know them. So, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees, now the Pharisees were just a denomination of the Jews, it's sort of like, you know, you got the Baptists, the Methodists, uh, Presbyterians. It's just a, another denomination. The Pharisees. Uh, the two biggest denominations of the Fer uh, Judaism was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were basically the priests of the temple, whereas the Pharisees were more, uh, they believed the entire Old Testament. Whereas the fair, uh, Sadducees only believed the first five books of Moses, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They didn't accept the Psalms. They didn't accept the minor prophets. They didn't accept Ezekiel or Isaiah or Jeremiah. But you got to realize their job was the book of Leviticus in the temple the sacrifices and what have you. All right, so verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Jesus' disciples, and they asked, Why eateth, 
Why eateth your master with Repu uh, publicans, republicans, and sinners? Why does Jesus sit around eating with those these evil people, man? These 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 tax collectors and and sinners in general. Why? Verse twelve. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, "They that be whole need not a physician." You know, those that are healthy, they don't need a doctor, but they that are sick. You see, the sinners were sick spiritually. Verse 13, Jesus speaking, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. Go learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice and not sacrifice. Jesus wants to show us mercy, not animal sacrifice. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am come, uh, I'm sorry, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, you've got sinners to repentance. And there's famous preachers out there, especially one from Tempe, Arizona, that'll tell you, oh, oh, you know, repentance doesn't mean turning from sin. But that's doesn't does that sound like uh, turning from unbelief to belief? Jesus says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, the publicans and the sinners, of which I was chief. Then came to him the disciples of John. This is not John the Apostle. This is John the Baptist's disciples. You know, John, John the Baptist had people following him just like Jesus did. I don't know how many, but... He had disciples. And they were saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast off? You know, uh, fasting is, you know, not eating. And oft means often. So why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But thy disciples fast not. Hey, Jesus, how come we... we uh, Deny ourselves food, but your disciples don't. What's up with that, dude? Well, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but that would be the modern idea. Verse 15, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn, as long as the bridegroom is with them? See, the Jesus is the groom, and the church is his bride. And fasting with sackcloth and ashes and repentance of sin is what basically John the Baptist was teaching, and not just John, I mean the, the Old Testament prophets and everybody. That's what they taught. But Jesus is saying, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. And that happened when Jesus was crucified. Verse 16, no man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Um, you know, if you have an old garment, uh, the ladies understand this. When you buy cotton clothing and you wash it, it's going to shrink. So 
once you've washed it a few times, it stops shrinking. But if you took a new piece of cloth and sewed a patch, and then you wash it, the patch is going to shrink, and it's going to rip the hole. It's going to make it worse. Verse 17. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. Now, I don't know if you know it, but uh, I had a really great science teacher in high school. Mr. Shepard, I love that guy. He taught us how to make homemade wine. Well, kids, uh, you take uh, Welch's grape juice and you pour some sugar in it. And then you throw in some uh, uh, brewer's yeast. And then you put a balloon over it. Well, of course, you got to heat it up. And then when the uh, yeast starts eating the sugar, it produces alcohol as a waste product. Basically, alcohol is a poison, really. It is. And um, every year, some college kid overdoses, poisons themselves, drinking too much alcohol. Every year, I read about it. And uh, the balloon expands. And then when the balloon contracts, the stuff is ready. And then what you do is you run it through a filter, get all the yeast out, and you're left with alcohol. Well, wine. And if you were to take wine and put it into uh, like a, a wine skin or something, it could, you know, it could burst it because of all the... Uh, the CO2, that's exactly what it is. It's carbon dioxide. It expands. So, so you put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. So there you go. All right, let's go to Matthew 11, verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples... Why 12? Why not 11 or 13? Hmm, good question. How many tribes were there? How many tribes of Israel were there? 12. Yeah. You know, it's... <laughs> and there's 12 gates in the t and into the New Jerusalem. 12 gates, one for each tribe. You know, the Bible... People f say that the... Uh, Bible was written by men. I tell you what, I, there's no way I could I could spend an entire lifetime trying to make a fake uh, book like the Bible, and I couldn't do it. And besides, if you made a fake book that people didn't like, and they were going to kill you for this fake book, to save your life, wouldn't you deny that, you know, deny it? Oh, yeah, that's that book's fake. You know, people died to give us the Bible. People died for their faith in Christ. And all they had to do was deny, and they would have been able to live. And if you knew something was fake, why in the world... Would you not own up to it to save your life? I mean, really, it's it's foolish. Why would people die for a lie? Nobody wants to die for a lie. So, yeah. All right, so, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John, John the Baptist, had heard in the prison the works of Christ, 
he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? Are you the Christ? You know, or do we look for somebody else? Verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. And let me tell you something, people. Leprosy is one of the worst diseases. Oh, it's horrible. I mean, people's fingers and toes fall off because leprosy just, it's horrible. Um, yeah, the United States almost had uh, only a, a couple, a few dozen cases of leprosy in the entire country in the 1950s. Just a few, a few dozen cases. That's all they had in the entire U.S. And then they started allowing all these people from uh, a certain Caribbean idol, uh, island uh, that they called Haiti. And then they, they all flocked to Florida. And in Miami-Dade County alone, yeah, Miami is a city and a county. Miami-Dade County, I grew up there as a kid, young kid. They have more cases of leprosy in that one county alone than the entire United States had in the 1950s. Leprosy. You know Haiti, uh, land of voodoo, land of zombies. Yeah. Yeah. And then <laughs> what's funny is the uh, B-L-A-C-K Hebrews will tell you that Haiti is the tribe of Levi, the, the, the tribe that uh, God set aside to serve him. Really? So voodoo and zombies, uh, that's serving, serving what God? Not the God of the Bible. No, uh-uh. So, yeah, seriously, they, they say Haiti is uh, Levi, the tribe of Levi. Yeah. Uh, Bob studied this much stuff too much, I think, you know. So, they asked, Jesus, are, are you uh, the Christ or are we looking for somebody else? Jesus says, go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. There was never... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. There was never any prophet that did all these things. Uh, there was might have been a prophet that did one thing or the other thing, but no prophet in the Old Testament did all these things. Verse 6. Jesus speaking, And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. You know, there's a lot of people that are offended in, you know, Christ. Christ is, the preaching of the cross is offensive to some people. And one day it's going to be illegal in this world. Christianity is going to be illegal one day. Probably not long after the two witnesses appear. If we live long enough to see it happen. Verse 7, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, John the Baptist, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? 
a reed shaken with the wind? Uh, you know, he's talking to the multitudes that were listening to John the Baptist. And John lived in the wilderness. And Jesus is saying, well, when you went out to go see John in the wilderness, what, do you, what were you seeing? A reed shaken with the wind? Now, I believe this is talking about, um, you know how politicians are? Whichever way the wind blows, that's what they're for. Oh, yeah. You know, whichever way the wind blows, that's, that's what they're going to say. You know, John was not a reed shaken with the wind. Verse 8, but what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? A guy with soft clothing? No. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea. Oh, yeah. Yeah, John was a prophet. Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. But this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And I cover that in, I think, part two or part one of this series where Jesus is quoting Isaiah about the messenger preparing the way for the Lord. Oh, yeah. Verily, I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Hmm. You know, John... The Baptist is considered the greatest of all the prophets, according to Jesus. What kind of a testimony is that, huh? Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Oh, yeah. Well, let's take a look at something. All right, Revelation 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Heaven. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. They were given the boot. They were booted out of heaven. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, boy. I, I'm sorry. I missed up. Verse 7. And there was war in heaven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. See, the dragon and his angels fought, but they didn't prevail. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. They were kicked out, right? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. Hmm. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the power of the Lamb. I mean, I'm sorry, by the, I'm sorry. And he overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. 
Boy, tell that to the pre-trib rapture crowd. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath. He's mad, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Oh, yeah. All right, so the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Well, King Herod was the one that put the money into building the temple in the days of Jesus and John the Baptist. You know, Herod, the family Herod, you know, the ones that killed all the children in Bethlehem under, what was it, under two years of age and under? Yeah. Yeah, Herod, Herod was bad news bears, people. Bad news. A whole family. And they, uh, they were responsible for the deaths of a number of people. And the kingdom, you know, the, the temple was supposed to be the place of worship. And they had turned it into uh, a den of devils. All right, let's take a look at the book of John. You know, John the Disciple, not the Baptist. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. So there's a marriage, a wedding going on, and uh, Jesus and his family were invited. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. You know, uh, they must have ran out of wine, right? Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Hmm. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. So I have a feeling that uh, it's probably Mary's uh, friends or somebody really close because here it is. She's giving orders, you know, whatever he, uh, whatever my son tells you to do, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. So a firkin is about eight or nine gallons. Uh, let me put that in liters. That would be about 35 liters. So, you know, uh, it's like 35 bottles of wine. So you're talking, uh, yeah, you can get a lot of people uh, drunk on that much, right? All right, so uh, let's see. Verse 7. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said, and he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. So, you know. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Isn't that how it always is? You know, when you're, you have a party, you give everybody the good stuff until they've had a few drinks. And when everybody starts feeling good, then you bring out the rot gut because nobody really cares. Um, but this is the opposite. And I've had Baptists tell me, oh, Jesus didn't turn water into wine. 
it was grape juice. Well, this whole thing about turning, uh, you know, drinking the good wine first, and then, you know, that which is worse after would make no sense at all unless it was alcohol. You know, oh, you, you, you brought out the, uh, the, the, the okay grape juice, but, but then you saved the really good grape juice for later. No, no, it was, it was wine, period. I, it's, you know, I don't know where Baptists come up with some of this stuff, but, uh, and I pick on the Baptists a lot because guess what Bible college I went to? Yeah. So, uh, verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So can you imagine if you were one of the servants that were hired to deliver the water, wine or whatever, you know, you're you know you filled up this pot with water and then it turned into wine. I mean, you'd have to be going, whoa, dude, this guy is, you know. I don't know how many of those servants became believers in Christ, but uh, you kind of wonder, you know. So, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. And this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, Passover is, in the Bible, is considered the beginning of spring. It falls around the middle of to late March or early to mid April. And it, I don't know how to set the date. I've had people ask me, I don't know. I was not trained as a Levite. I know the you know who's claim their certain way, and then there's other people that claim it a different way, and some people go by the moon. I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, it was spring. And, you know, people have weddings in the spring because they want to be outside and enjoy. And, you know, in wintertime, it's too cold, right? Unless, of course, you come down to Florida, which, yeah. I used to do weddings. I used to perform weddings. Uh, so yeah, I know a lot about weddings. I've done hundreds of them. I couldn't even tell you how many I did. But, uh, all right, so, oh, and why do they say go up? And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Well, the reason he went up to Jerusalem is because uh, Jerusalem's built on seven hills. Yeah. You know, Mystery Babylon is built on seven hills. And everybody will point to Rome. Rome's on seven hills, but so is Jerusalem. And what can I tell you? All right, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple. Oh boy, Jesus went to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. What do you mean money money changers? Well, people would bring in a Roman coin and the guys in the temple would say, oh, oh, this ain't no good. This, this has got uh, Caesar's picture on it, his image. We can't have that. Uh, we gotta, you gotta have the holy coins, you know, the temple coins. And they got temple coins today, even. Uh, I think they got Trump's image on them, right? So they were money changers. Now, a lot of people may not know it, but currency 
used to be a measurement of a precious metal. You've heard of a, a pound, the British pound. A British pound was uh, a pound of sterling silver, which was 12 troy ounces. A dollar, a, a dollar used to be um, one ounce of 90% silver. That's the definition, the legal definition of a dollar. Not a piece of paper that has one dollar printed on it with a picture of a president. That's not a dollar. That's just a piece of paper that says one dollar. A dollar is an ounce of silver. Yeah. And a shekel was the same thing. It was a, a measurement of a metal, a precious metal, something that was worth something. So here it is, these money changers, you know, it's like you go to them and with, uh, I don't know, an, an ounce of silver, which was a Roman coin, and the temple chain, the money changers would say, oh, oh, okay, well, we're going to give you whatever, and as an example, we're going to give you this temple coin, which is really only a quarter of an ounce or half an ounce. But this is a holy coin that you can throw into the temple's treasury. We can't have those Roman coins. You know, that's sacrilegious. So they were making a big profit. You know, they, they didn't have any problems spending that Roman coin once they left the temple. Uh-uh. So Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge, a whip, of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money, uh, the changers' money and overthrew the tables. Hmm. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Uh, in another one of the Gospels, well, let's read it. Now, I'm not saying this is the same time period. This might have been another instance, but uh, you get the idea. In Luke 19.46, uh, Jesus speaking, saying unto them, the money changers, it is written, my house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Matthew 21, 13. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Hmm. Yeah. Get the idea? Yeah. All right, so in the book of John, chapter 2, verse 15, and when he had made a scourge of small cords, you know, everybody says, what would Jesus do? Uh, take a whip and beat people out of the temple? Uh, yeah. What would Jesus do? Yeah. But, oh, but Jesus is so loving and, and kind and, you know, uh, yeah, to those that deserve it. And when he had made a scourge of small cores, he drove, drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew their, the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Now remember, uh, Herod had financed the rebuilding of the temple not because he wanted to worship God he wanted control and uh, you want to know why they didn't like Jesus things like this he was cutting into their business and sadly uh, tell me that most churches today are not a business for those of you that are interested look up what 501 C, as in Charlie, C as in Charlie, 501c3 IRS uh, regulations are. Most so-called churches are IRS-approved, 
government chartered businesses with the name church in it. They're no, it's no different. You know? Verse 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, The Jews said unto Jesus, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. Forty-six years. Can you imagine a building under construction for forty-six years? Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Oh yeah? It took us forty-six years to build this, and you're going to build it in three days? Verse 21. But he spake at the temple of his body. You want to believe in Jesus and him being the temple with the sacrifice? Or do you want to believe the you-know-whos and their, their redone temple? And by the way, people, um, there is a, a, a replica of the temple down in San Paulo, Brazil. Um, I think there's a, a Mormon one also, but I'm, I'm not talking about the Mormon one. But there's, there's a temple in Brazil. And they built it in three and a half years, which corresponds to the uh, 42 months, 1200 and, was it 1260 days? Or I forget exactly, but it's, it's about 42 months uh, in the book of Revelation when uh, the man of sin proclaims himself that he is God. But that's a whole nother study in, a, in and of itself. Verse 22, When therefore he, Jesus, was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name. His name. You want to know why they want to get rid of the name of Jesus and replace it with Yeshua? Yeah. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. And by the way, people, the false prophet for the man of sin, the Antichrist, the beast, the son of perdition, that one's also going to be able to do miracles too. And a lot, almost all the world's going to follow him. And those churchgoers that don't bother to read the Bible, you know the book that people died to give us, but they, they won't even bother to pick it up? Uh, there, many people are going to be fooled. Many. Probably most. I don't know. Uh, you know, the Bible says to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman Workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I forget what book that is. I think it's in the Timothy. All right, so. Um, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. What's in man? An evil heart. You ever hear people say, oh, follow your heart. Follow your heart. In the book of Jeremiah, 17 and verse 9, the prophet writes, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the answer is God. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Follow your heart? Uh, I think not. All right, let's go back. All right, I'm skipping around a little bit here, but let's go back to Matthew 11. Um, Matthew 11, 11. Verily I say unto you, Jesus speaking, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding... He that is least in the kingdom of heaven 
is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, Elijah, Greek rendering of Elijah, which was for to come. So, I covered this in a previous study that uh, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And Elijah was supposed to come before the day of judgment of, uh, when Christ comes to reclaim his, this world and burns it up. And some people will tell you that John the Baptist was Elijah but that's not true. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. So, I mean, the Pharisees even asked John, Art thou that prophet? Are you Elijah? And he said, No. And I think that John the Baptist knew who he was. So, you know, but I've had people argue with me. So, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you. Yeah, we've been, you know, playing music. And ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. For John came neither drinking, uh, e neither eating nor drinking, you know, John John wasn't drinking wine, and he wasn't a, a, a pig. You know, some people uh, eat and become very obese because they eat too much. But for John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he hath a devil. So John wasn't drinking wine, and they said, oh, well, he's, he's devil-possessed or demon-possessed. 19. The Son of Man, Christ, came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber. Basically, that's saying a drunken pig. A friend, uh, behold, a friend, uh, behold a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Yeah. That's sort of kind of like saying you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you drink, they call you a drunk. And if you don't, well, he's possessed of a devil. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. According to the wisdom of this world. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. His miracles. Because they repented not. Listen to what Jesus says. Woe unto thee, Chorazon, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works, the miracles, which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and in ashes. And dressing in sackcloth and ashes was a you know, fasting and prayer. I mean, that's the ultimate humiliation of the flesh. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. And I've heard people say, oh, there's no hell. Well, Jesus talked about hell, and I believe Jesus. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. If Jesus had been walking the streets of Sodom back in the days of Lot, doing all these miracles and telling people to repent, Jesus said that Sodom would still be around. But Capernaum, they they listened to Jesus and saw the miracles. 
but they wouldn't repent. But I say unto you this, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid, thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Yeah, you think you're smart and you know all about God? God will hide things from you. Do you know that's, uh, check this out. Do you know that why Jesus spoke to them in parables? Let's take a look. In Matthew 13, Jesus was speaking parables. And then in verse 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? You know, why do you, why do you always talk in parables? 11. He, Jesus answered, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. I mean, Jesus spoke in parables to hide the meanings of his words to some people. His disciples could understand, but other people he hid the God, he hid it from them. Can you imagine that? Matthew eleven twenty five. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. So the Pharisees that were, you know, brilliant Bible scholars in their own mind, the gospel was hidden from them. But who are the babes? The publicans, the sinners. They would sit at the feet of Jesus to be taught. But the Pharisees, oh, I got a doctorate degree in the Old Testament. I don't, why, I don't need to listen to this guy. I mean, Jesus should be sitting at my feet, learning from me, Mr. King Pharisee. The wise and prudent in their own eyes, anyways. Verse 26. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Hmm. Verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh yeah. How hard is it to believe in Christ? Not very. Not very hard at all. Well, everybody, this will be the end, uh, the end of part three of the life of John the Baptist. He's getting ready to uh, lose his head, so to speak. So, And uh, what can I tell you? All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. To God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.